Hey guys, welcome back to Home Church and thank you so much for joining us again. We are so excited to be with you and actually our very pastor is back. Dave is preaching today to share God's word. But before we dive into anything and get into worship, let's just pray before we start our service. Father, we just thank you that we can still gather together online. Lord, I thank you that we can worship you in spirit and in truth, wherever we are at, whatever is going on in our life, no matter the circumstance, God, that we can we can praise you, that we can stop and we can reflect on who you are and we can focus that actually that we are, we are loved by you and that brings about so much freedom. So Father, we just pray that you, Holy Spirit, just breathe into our day today and that we can just come meet and encounter you. Lord, we want to give you all the praise that you are that you are due. Lord, we thank you that we can just come and be before you and be in your presence. In your name. Amen. Let's worship, guys. Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in
blazing sun shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints. My gaze transfixed on Jesus' face.
So great to be back with you this morning and uh, opening the, the Word of God together. I want to thank Darnell and Mark for filling in for me over the past few weeks just to give me a couple of weeks off. That was very, very much appreciated. Um, and I'm looking forward today to starting a new series. Before I went on holiday, we finished off a series on Joseph in the Old Testament. And today we're going to look at the book of Colossians, which is a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a, a small town, but uh, an influential town, called Colossae. The letter was written to a town that Paul had never ever been in. He'd never really, he'd, he'd never met the people here. Um, but he loved them enough to, to write them a letter. The letter focuses on a lot of things that they need to put right. A lot of the things that you have, that they had to do to, um, to improve, if you like, to grow closer, to improve their work with Jesus, to grow closer to him, to have more of an understanding of him. And as we move through the book, it will be addressing an awful lot of issues that we as Christians should prioritise getting right in our life. So it's going to be an interesting book. I believe it's going to be a very challenging book for us and a very challenging series for us. Uh, but I really look forward to what God has to say to us as a church as we read through this book together. Let's, uh, let's start with a word of prayer. God, we thank you for loving us. We thank you that you love us enough to give us your word in written form that challenges and should transform our lives. We thank you for caring about us enough that you don't want to leave us as you found us. And God, I pray that as we read this book, your Holy Spirit would flow through what's said, that it would be your words that people would hear and not mine. And God, that our lives would indeed be impacted, that we would be transformed that we, we'd, we would be changed by the love, the grace, the power of Jesus. So God, go before me today and speak to your people, I pray. Amen. If you're joining us for the first time at Home Church, we just love to read through books of the Bible and look at some of the things that God has to say to us through it. There's so much amazing things in the Bible that we can't possibly cover them all, but we're going to try... Uh, and look at one or two things today. So today we're going to be reading from Colossians chapter 1 and we're going to be doing just the first part of chapter 1 to the end of verse 14. So it starts with a greeting. It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. So it's written by Paul. Timothy's with him. It's probably narrated. Paul, for those of you that don't know, uh, was one of the major pioneers of the early church. This is a guy who 
killed Christians. This is a guy who captured Christians, who put them into captivity, who persecuted them, who went after them more than anybody else. And God, Jesus met him in a powerful way as he was walking down the Damascus Road. It's an amazing story. You should read it up if you don't know it. He got blinded by a bright light. Jesus spoke to him. And this guy, who was the one of the biggest persecutors in the history of the church, gave his life to Jesus and it changed forever. So that Paul's the guy who's writing this letter. He's writing it from a place of captivity, which I think is significant for us just now. Right now we're in this middle of this pandemic and although lockdown restrictions have been somewhat eased, it's life's not normal. Life's that wee bit more difficult for all of us. And of course there's places like Aberdeen this week that have just been shut down again and, and who knows what's going to happen in Glasgow. Things are tough. Some of us feel a little bit in isolation. We're not seeing the people we're used to. We're probably spending more time indoors than what we normally would. Well, Paul's someone who understands this. At the point he writes this letter, he himself has been persecuted. The persecutor became the persecuted for Jesus. He's in a prison cell. He's shackled up. But he's speaking these words probably to Timothy, who's writing them down uh, and taking them to the early church in Colossae. So verse 3 says, we always, talking about himself and Timothy, maybe some other people, we always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you. And right here at the start of the book, the first three verses speak volumes to me in our current situation. Paul would have every right to be thinking about himself. Paul gave up being an important man, a powerful man, to being in a prison cell himself for the sake of, of preaching the gospel. Things were not going particularly well in his life at this point in time. He could have been lamenting over how difficult things were. He could have been working through... If, worried about focusing on what was going on in his life and how he was going to get out of this and, and what was going to become of this and was he going to be killed, was he going to be released, what was going to be happening. But actually what Paul was doing is what we all as Christians should be doing during a time like this. He was praying. But actually more powerful than praying is he wasn't praying for himself. He wasn't just concerned about his own situation. He was concerned for other people. And of course the Bible tells us to value others above ourself. And Paul's doing that here from the very prison cell. He's taking time to write to people. He's valuing them. People he's never met. People he doesn't know. But he's shown them the love of Jesus. And he's saying to them, we always thank God. You know, do we do this regularly. We're praying for you guys. We thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. And I want to encourage us today as Christians, particularly those who are part of the home church family, as we go through this lockdown period, as we go through coronavirus, yes, things are changing, but things are still tough. But who are we praying for? What's our focus? Is our focus on ourselves, Or are we, as the Bible directs us to be, are we valuing others as more important than ourselves? Are we praying for other people as well. It's easy to come to God and say, God will you, God would you, God please, God help me, 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 me. That's not what we're called to do as Christians. We're called to, to value others. We're called to pray for others. And just as Paul here in a prison cell is praying for this church in Colossae that he's never met, let's take this lesson and apply it to our lives as a church. Let's be praying for people. Might be people we don't know, might be the persecuted church in other parts of the world, might be other churches in our nation that are struggling right now, it might be pastors and church leaders who have never led a church through this situation before, there are Christians right now who are struggling, there are people who are not Christians right now who are struggling and who desperately need Jesus. Let's make sure we're taking the time that we've been afforded at this time to pray for them. 
lastly, just on this point, what I love is the fact that he's caring so much about people he hasn't even met. So often we can hear about things going on in the persecuted church and other parts of the world. If you're watching this and you're not a Christian and you don't know what's going on, there are countries in the world where it's illegal to be a Christian. There are countries where you will get put in jail for being a Christian. There are countries that you will be killed for being a Christian. Even in this country of Scotland, this hate crime bill that they're putting through, or trying to put through, I don't believe it will go through in Jesus' name, but they're trying to put it through. These things are to make things difficult to speak the truth, to make things difficult to, to be a Christian. Of course, it's not even a patch on the persecuted church. But it's so easy for us to think that's happening over there in another country. That's nothing to do with us. We've got our own things here, but, but that's not what the Bible teaches us. We may never have met these guys. We may not know these guys, but they are our brothers and sisters in Christ. And just as Paul is praying for, taking time out for, writing to people that he doesn't know, please, church, we need to use the Bible as an example. Let's be praying for the persecuted church. Let's be praying for our brothers and sisters in this country and, and other countries and other parts of the world that are struggling, whether we've met them before or not. It goes on, uh, verse 4, since, uh, we, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you've heard before in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you as indeed the whole, whole world. And it's bearing fruit and increasing as it also does among you. So Paul's seen he's given thanks for them because of you know a number of good things that he's hearing about the love that they have for other people. Uh, because of the gospel... And he's confirming what we know as Christians, that when the gospel is preached, it bears fruit. It says the gospel has been preached in the whole world, and it's bearing fruit, and it's increasing, and it's also doing that amongst you. Now, there's so much in this passage, and I don't want to speak for too long today, so I'm going to try and get through it. But you know what I'm like? I might struggle with that. <laughs> we'll see how we got on. The, when the gospel is preached, it will bear fruit. That, that, that is what the Bible says and it's a guarantee. So if we have seen our church is not growing, thankfully, so thankfully at home church, our church is growing. But when we see churches about in the, in the nation and, and they're not growing, it would suggest to me that the gospel has not been faithfully preached because the Bible saying that when the Bible, when the word of the truth of the gospel is preached, it bears fruit and it increases. So we must always be an increasing church and we must always be an increasing family. Do you have a member of your family? Do you have a friend? Do you have a colleague? Do you have someone in your street, a neighbour, that doesn't know Jesus? I would encourage you to share the gospel with them because when you share the gospel, it bears fruit. I might come back to that a little bit uh, later on if we have time. Um, so where are we at? If you preach the gospel, it's going to be a fruit. We're going to see an increase. Absolutely. Yes, that's what I was going to say. You can tell I don't use notes anymore, don't you? I'm just reading the Bible and trying to explain what it's saying. The book of Colossians, there's a lot of stuff to come up later on in the book eh, to challenge people on their behaviours. There was, there was things going on in this church that were not godly. That were, that were not right uh, and uh, Paul was writing to encourage this church to get closer to Jesus and to change some of the things that were going wrong but what he does here is he's, he's really teaching us actually how to deal with difficult conversations see the Bible has the answers to everything in it there's not a situation that we have to deal with as Christians that the Bible doesn't teach us how to do it so the, what we're seeing here is before he gets to the correction, before he gets to saying this thing, these things that you're doing are not right and you shouldn't be doing them, he, he's building them up, he's pointing out what's good about them. Now as a parent, as a, as a husband, as a wife, as a boss, as a friend, as a colleague, as anything, 
there, there's going to be situations and conversations we need to have that are not easy, but perhaps people need a little bit of correction. We have to always be sure as Christians that we're always encouraging people. You know, as a parent, if all I did was talk about the negatives that my kids done, if every time they done something wrong, I picked up on it, but I never ever commented on all the fantastic things about them, that, that relationship would deteriorate very, very quickly. If I pointed out every fault, every mistake my wife made, I never told her how amazing she was, how special she was, how loved she was. I didn't notice all the good things that she'd done. That relationship would deteriorate very quickly. Before Paul comes to the negatives and the difficulties, he spends time affirming the good things that he's heard about these guys, the good things that he's seen in these guys. And that's a really important lesson to take into every relationship that we have. Let's see the good in people. And, and as Christians, we should be holding each other to account and we, we should be encouraging each other to get into deeper relationships with Jesus. But let's make sure we're also building each other up and, and pointing out the amazing things we see in people. If you see someone doing something well, tell them they're doing a good job. Encourage them. Let's get behind people. I think it's so important. Um, so it says, They're bearing fruit and increasing as it does among you since the day that they heard it. And understood the grace of God in truth. And that's what the gospel is. The grace of God. When you understand the grace of God. It's going to bear fruit. And it's going to change your life. It says just as you learned uh, from Epaphras. Our, belev our beloved fellow servant. Again if I've got time I'll come back and talk about who Epaphras was. This is the guy it looks like who planted this church in Colossae. And also in some other neighbouring towns. And it's actually a really good, a cool thing for me. A cool little story and, and, and a really good little point. But I want to get through the next bit and then I'll try actually and finish on that. This guy Epaphras, I'm going to come back to him. It's, it tells us that he's a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf. Speaking to the, the church again in Colossae. And has made, has made known to us your love. In the spirit, again, he's affirming them. We've heard about how loving you guys are. We've heard about how much you love each other. We've heard about how much you love God. Before he comes to the, but by the way, we're going to fix this, which we are going to come to a little bit later on. He continues, verse 9, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you. So from the day Epaphras spoke to Paul, and, and, you know, he let him know the good things about the church. He also let him know the struggles. It says, since the day he heard that, he's, they have not ceased to pray for them. We need to persist in prayer. Paul's in prison and he's got these guys on a prayer list. He's not just prayed for them once. They're on a prayer list and he's prayed for them consistently. Ella's amazing at this. Ella's got a prayer list in her room. And she's got different names for every day. And, uh, you know, most of you watching this will be on it. But I tell you, there's a lot of people on that prayer list who are now part of our church and Christians who were not part of our church and were not Christians when Ella added them to her prayer list. She's a real challenge to me on it, actually. She, she prays for this church like nobody else, let me tell you. But I've seen firsthand that she's praying for these names uh, and, and God's doing a miracle in their life. God's doing something amazing in their life and she prays for them. Some people every day some people every week. At what prayer works. God answers prayer. If there's someone that God's put in your heart. If there's someone you want to see become a Christian. If there's someone you want to see change. If there's a situation in your own life. Then pray. But don't cease praying. Continue to pray. From the day we heard we've not ceased to pray for you. Asking for these next things. And, and this is really important. So Paul's in prison again. He could be asking for anything for these guys. And he asks for some specific things, which lead me to believe that these are the most important things or amongst the most important things that we as Christians should be praying for over ourselves and over our church. Firstly, that you will be filled with the knowledge of his will. The most important thing we can have in our lives as Christians is an understanding of the will of God. When we become a Christian, we have the very creator of the world, the creator of the heavens and the earth. 
available to us. The Bible tells us that he has a plan for our lives. I think that's incredible. And we all have an opportunity to listen to that plan and to follow that plan. So more important than money, more important than health, more important than protection, more important than anything, the first thing Paul in prison prays for is that these guys would be filled with the knowledge of the will of God. So that for me as a Christian, the first thing, the most important thing I want in my life is to know what God's will is for my life. The most important thing I want as a church leader is to know the will of God for our church. If you're watching this today and you're not sure of the will of God, or perhaps you're watching this today and you, you kind of do know God's will, but you know you're not living in it, you're off doing your own thing, I would encourage you to change that. If you don't know God's will, ask him for it. Close your eyes, pray, ask him for it. And if you do know it, and you've kind of put other things first, other things in more, there's nothing more important than God's will being done in your life. I want to encourage you to put that right. So first, that you would be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So he's praying that we'll have spiritual wisdom, that we'll have God given wisdom to understand things properly. And the reason he's praying for these things, the reason he's praying that God's will would be done in our life, that we would know not God's will, the reason he's praying for spiritual wisdom, the reason he's praying for understanding is so that we could walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Now, if I go right back to verse 2, this uh, letter is written to the saints and faithful brothers. These guys are Christians, there's no question of that. They're called saints, they're called faithful brothers. But he's still saying, I'm asking, I'm, I'm constantly praying for you that you'll be filled with this stuff so that you can walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. So is it possible, church, that we can believe in Jesus? Is it possible that we can know who he is and not walk in a manner worthy of him? I absolutely believe not only is it possible, but that sadly many of us are living that life. And living a life like that is not living in, on, on God's will. It's living under our, under our own. And you're massively missing the point. And the only person, or the biggest person you're going to hurt, not, not the only person, the biggest person you're going to hurt by ignoring God's will, not living a life worthy of God and doing your own thing, the biggest person you're going to hurt is yourself. If that's you today, I would ask you to let God do a work in your life. So he's praying that people will be filled with knowledge of his will in this, in spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work. Again, when we do work for God, we see fruit, we see growth, we see impact. And again it says, and increasing in the knowledge of God. It's important, church, that we are constantly trying to increase in the knowledge of God. We're supposed to be, and I know I've said this before, but I make no apology for saying it again. We're supposed to be increasing in maturity as Christians. We're not supposed to become Christians one day and be the same the next day. We're not supposed to be the same the next month or the next year. And we're certainly not supposed to be the same 10 years down the line. But sadly, so many of us are. And that's why, actually, to be honest, we struggle in life. Because, listen to this, it says that we have to increase in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power. Increasing in the knowledge of God gives us strength. Increasing in the knowledge of God builds us up. It gives us the strength to deal with the difficult things the world throws at us. Because sometimes a curveball will come at you and you won't know how to handle it, but the Bible does. So if we know this book, we know how to handle it. Something bad's going to happen, you don't know your way out. The Bible knows the way out. But if we don't know the Bible, then we also don't know the way out. And therefore, as Christians, some of us 10 years, 20 years, even 30 years, we find ourselves in situations 
that the Bible tells us how to deal with, but because we've never read this book, we're stuck. God doesn't want us to be stuck. God gives us the answers. He's given us every answer that we're going to need, and it's all in this book. Paul is praying from a prison cell that this church would be increasing in the knowledge of God because it's so, so important to do that. He's praying, as I said a minute ago, the first thing, to be filled with the knowledge of his will. Where do you think we get the knowledge of God's will from? Again, it's from this book. It's from the Bible. People think we'll get magically spoken to as we lie in our backs. Occasionally, God speaks to people like that, but it's not all the time. We think that we can lie in bed at night and by the process of osmosis we're going to understand the Bible, we're going to know what the Bible says. It doesn't work like that. We need to read it. And as we read it, we will be filled with the knowledge of his will because this book is the will and the word of God all the way through it. Uh, it will help us to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. If we, As we do that, we're displaying the truth of the gospel because we were lost, we were a mess and now we're not. We've been found, we've been set free. We've, we, God's doing a work in our life. So we're going to bear good fruit in everything that we do because in everything we do, we're displaying the love of God and then uh, he's praying also that we increase in the knowledge of God by reading this book which will strengthen us with all power to deal with, with whatever life is going to throw at us. It says, according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. So whatever situation you're facing, if we have the knowledge of God, we'll be strengthened with the power of his glorious might to endure. We'll be given patience when we don't know. Like this situation right now, we don't know when it's coming to an end. I don't know when churches are going to come back. I'd love it. I'm missing you guys like crazy. I would love us to be back in church. I'd love us to be worshipping. I'd love us to be doing all of that. But I love you far too much to put you in any danger. We can't do it until it's safe to do so. But God will give us the patience and he'll allow us to do it with joy. That's what it says. For all endurance and patience with joy. We're going to have joy being patient. We're going to have joy enduring things. But we get the strength to endure because of the knowledge of God. Guys, if you don't know this book, if you've never read it, I'm going to encourage you to do so. Last September, we as a church started a Bible read through in a year. And at the 1st of September, we finished it. It's been incredible for those who have done it with us. Now I'm aware there are many people who are part of Home Church today who were not part of Home Church last September. Um, and, and, in fact, I think we've doubled in size, more than doubled in size since last September. So there are many who have not been doing this Bible read through in a year with us. But for the ones that have, for the ones that have completed it, I know how much it's blessed their life. So here's what I'm going to suggest that finishes on the 1st of September. I'm going to suggest that we have a, a small uh, break from that. Not a break from reading the Bible, but a, a break from the, the, the Bible in a year. Just to read, to go back over some things that maybe God was speaking to us mostly about. And then from the 1st of October, October, November and December, we're going to do a Bible, we're going to do a New Testament read through. As a church, we're going to read through the New Testament together in three months. I'm going to look at the best way to do that. And then we'll start with a full Bible in a year read through again from the 1st of January. Okay, so I'm putting that out there just now. If you are if you want to just reach out and let me know that you want to be part of this Bible, read through this New Testament, read through from October to December, then we're going to do that. And again, as we read about Jesus and we read these letters, we read this stuff, it's going to impact and change our lives and the Bible was told to you how important it is we understand uh, the will of God, how important it is we increase in the knowledge of God. So we're going to do that, and that's how we're going to do it. First of October, New Testament read through. First of January, Bible in a year, 2021. Excited about that. Sorry for that little announcement right there in the middle. Okay, so, and it, it says, it's verse 12, in doing this, we're giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of of the saints and light. He's delivered us from the domain of darkness. He's transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. In whom we have redemption for the forgiveness of sins. So God 
has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints, of, 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 of other Christians. We can, we can share this stuff because we've been qualified to do so. I said I'd come back to this guy, Epaphras. This guy planted the church in Colossae. He planted the church in other areas. There's always churches in this part of the world that Paul and the apostles haven't even been to. And you're thinking, how did this happen? Here's what I think. In Acts 19, we're told that the, the gospel is pe preached. Paul was in Ephesus um, in his preaching. And it says this continued for two years. He, he, he preached in a place called the Hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years. So that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both the Jews and the Greeks. So I suggest that this guy, Epaphras, where am I at? This guy, Epaphras, heard the gospel preached in Asia, in this hall, by Paul, and then went back to where he was from and shared the gospel with the people there. And the church of Colossae was born, and churches in other parts of the world was gone because someone heard the gospel, was qualified by God, and went and shared it. I hope I'm making sense today, guys. If for two weeks off, I might be out of practice. Guys, you don't need to be qualified to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's God who qualifies us. I, I actually love the fact I don't have a degree in theology and I've not been taught how to preach a sermon. I, I'm just opening this and, and saying what I think it says and I hope that works for people. But I, I don't need people, you know, quite often, I get questions sometimes, how come you're leading a church and you've no theology degree? I don't need a theology degree. I need knowledge of this book. It's God who gives that to me. It's God who qualifies me. And then I get a chance to, to share that and to share in the inheritance of the saints alike, just as this book says. You don't need a theology degree to share the gospel. God has qualified you the moment you were saved to share the gospel. Maybe you've never shared the gospel with anyone. Maybe you've never had the privilege of leading someone to Jesus. I believe that can change because you are qualified in the name of God to share what he has done in your life. And, and how do you share the gospel? Look, it's as simple as this. It tells us, verse 13, he's delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption for forgiveness of sins. So how do you share the gospel? Share your story, guys. I was a sinner. Christ changed my life. I was living in darkness, but I was delivered from the domain of darkness. I was delivered from the, from the hate. I was delivered from the unforgiveness. I was delivered from the sin. I was delivered to the weight that was over me as I lived in darkness. And I was transferred into the kingdom of Jesus. Share your story. Share your life transformation. Because if you're a true Christian today, if you're a true Christian, you will look differently than you looked before you were a Christian. People should know we're a Christian because we are different today than we used to be. Share the why. Share with people. God has qualified you. God has changed your life. Share that with people. This guy Epaphras went on and changed all these towns for Jesus. Paul, who probably shared the gospel for the first time with a guy, Epaphras. He's sitting in a prison cell, but because of him faithfully preaching the gospel two years before somewhere else, there's all these people all over the place becoming Christians. I mean, I don't know about you guys, that just massively excites me. That someone might, might hear me preach the gospel and then they go out and preach it and that gets... And who knows who gets saved? Who knows whose life gets transformed further down the line through something that you say today? Take your opportunities. There was a day that Billy Graham wasn't a Christian. Somebody shared the gospel with Billy Graham and look what happened through Billy Graham. Who are you sharing the gospel with? Let's take our opportunities. Jesus has the power to change our town. Jesus has the power to change our nation. He is changing our world. It says here, you know, the, the, the gospel is going around all the world. That's talking about the, the Roman world. But now it is going around the whole world. The whole world heard about Jesus and it all started with 12 guys, uh, a few more, well, 12 disciples 
Uh, some guys around Jesus and this guy called Paul sharing the gospel. Let's just start sharing the gospel. Let's not allow Satan to put us down. Let's not think we're not good enough. Let's certainly not think we're not qualified because the Bible tells us where qualification comes from. If to give thanks to the Father who's qualified us. God has qualified us to share the gospel. And as we share the gospel, we will see fruit in our church and our families and our communities and our workplaces and everything will change. I believe that. I'm going to leave it there, guys. There's so much to go through over the next few weeks and I'm looking forward to doing our book in Colossians. But I just want to encourage you. The book tells us that we can be delivered from darkness into light. If you're living in a dark place right now, if you're struggling with guilt of things, if you're struggling with unforgiveness, if you're struggling with hate, if there's a weight on you and you've tried everything and you can't get rid of it, doesn't matter what you've tried, this weight on you is not shifting. Let me tell you guys, there's one way to freedom and it's through Jesus Christ. And if you don't know him today, I'm going to encourage you to reach out to me so that I can be on the phone to you today, we'll video call, I'll introduce you to Jesus and let me tell you, your life will change forever. If you need to move from a place of darkness to a place of light, to a place of chains, to a place of freedom, then Jesus is ready and willing to change your life today. If that's you, would you reach out to me? If you're a Christian today, doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian. Really the first part of this, this book is telling us how important it is to, to mature in Christ, to grow in knowledge, to grow in understanding, to understand the will of God. If you're not sure what the will of God is in your life, but you, but, but you want to be, or if you know there's a call in your life, but you know you've, you've put other things as more important and you want prayers for that, I want you guys to reach out as well. God will do a work in people's lives today. I believe that in the name of Jesus. Guys, if you fall into any of those categories, would you just type me on Facebook or YouTube where you're watching? Would you send me an email, dave at homechurch.scot? Or just go to our Facebook page, Home Church Scotland, and send me a message. I'd love to pray with you. I'd love to encourage you. God's got so much more for us, guys. We've got loads to learn over the next few weeks. But let's make sure we get that right in our life. I want to increase in the knowledge of God. And I want to know his will for my life. Again, if you want to read, if you want to be part of this Bible read through, even if you're not part of Home Church, you can be part of that. Send me an email uh, and we'll get you hooked up for this October to December New Testament in three months. It's going to change lives, guys. I believe that. Let me just pray. God, I thank you for being with us this morning. God, I trust that you've spoken through me. Or in spite of me, I don't mind God as long as people that have been, you know, touched or impacted today by, by the words of Scripture. We thank you for Scripture. We thank you uh, for the importance it has in our lives, God. And I just ask that you would inspire us to read it more. God, I ask that you would inspire anyone who's never done a read-through before to get involved in that. God, I pray that we as a church would know your will. God, I pray that we as individuals would know your will. And God, I pray that if anyone watching today is feeling depression, is feeling the weight of something on top of them and they can't get rid of it, God, would you give them the courage to reach out today and have their lives changed as they move from a place of darkness into a place of light. God, would you do that? And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So thank you, Dave, for preaching today. It is, we have missed you and we just have been truly blessed by, by God sharing what he has stirred and put in your heart. Um, and yeah, guys, again, if anything, please, has, has hit home, then be in touch with us. We are literally, we will we'll be rapid as we possibly can. But um, just to give a wee look into what is happening over the next couple of weeks. So we have our big weekend that is happening in September. So that is Saturday the 12th and Sunday the 13th. Plans are still to follow as to Saturday and how that is going to look. Still not 100% sure because of 
guidelines as to everything with lockdown but over the next week or so hopefully we'll be able to get um, more details into how that is actually going to pan out practically for us um, but also we had our worship team go live from rehearsals so if you've missed that go back in the videos on our YouTube or further down in our on our page on Facebook and you'll be able to find it there the guys are doing a great job at rehearsing and putting stuff together for the live stream again we're super excited about this it's happening and we're going live for the first time for the full service on Sunday the 13th of September so we've got really exciting stuff that's happening um, also in October by the time that we have finished Bible in a year we are going to start doing the New Testament in three months so honestly get yourselves piped up for that and um, even if you want to try to do the Bible in a whole year in between then go for it but um, yeah we've got exciting stuff like that happening too also during our weeks we still have our prayer meetings on Thursdays so that's in between at 10 to 11 in the morning join us it is so good so refreshing and being in God's presence during that time it is so empowering it's so encouraging um and I believe that that is everything that I have to mention for this week but thank you so much for joining and we are just going to close now with one final last song again thank you so much worship team truly blessed by you let's give it all we've got guys join us next week Jesus is calling
father's arms are open wide forgiveness was born